Hello everybody, it's Sanier, Engineer, MBA and Investor and in today's video we are talking about Beam Therapeutics, all about Beam Therapeutics. In fact, we're talking about the highlights of the company, of Beam Therapeutics, uh, that was published about almost two weeks ago on January 8th. Um, I didn't really cover this video because there were other things I wanted to cover, especially with Saudi news and then of course uh, we went on to go on. Uh, the YouTuber Amit Investing channel, uh, which actually got a lot of new subscribers in this channel, guys. I think I'm going to do a lot more collaborations going forward. Um, look, everybody knew collaboration, you know, will get you more subscribers, will net you more people uh, watching your videos, but I just didn't think it would be that much of an impact. Uh, so clearly there's an overlap of people that are interested in this space, right? And I think that's the key here is to find those folks, right? You don't just want anybody to subscribe and just watch your channel just for the sake of it. You want people that are generally interested in CRISPR, in the technology, in the community, provide insights, gather insight, research, build conviction, provide new insights. Uh, it's like that positive feedback loop, right? So. Anyhow, I want to talk about here in this video, Beam Therapeutics highlights progress across base editing portfolio outlines 2024 anticipated milestones. So let's take a look. First patient dose successfully in Beacon, phase one, phase two trial of Beam 101 patients with sickle cell disease, significant enrollment so progress supports first expected clinical data readout in the second half of 2024. So it looks like uh, there's going to be a lot more enrollment this year. And of course, the big news here is that we are getting data for Beam 101. Uh, of course, this is a reminder, Beam 101 is also tackling sickle cell disease, but they're doing it obviously with their technology. Of course, we're talking about base editors. Uh, it's still an ex vivo method, so they're still extracting the cell out of the body of the human, doing some work on it, injecting back in the body of the human, but of course uh, it is with base editing, which of course the whole promise of base editors is that they're a lot more efficient, safer than CRISPR-Cas9, the first gen of CRISPR. Who knows what happens? I wanna see human data, I wanna see human data, I wanna see human data. So I just said that three times. I think it's pretty clear to our viewers. Uh, what are my thoughts on base editors at this point, right? So European Clinical Trial Application CTA submitted for BEAM 302 trial initiation in Alpha 1 AD plan for first half of 2024. Okay. IND application for BEAM 301 on track for first half of 2024. Okay. And we could look at cash runway expected to support the operating plans into 2027. So actually they have the best, I think uh, and TLA was around 2026, uh, CRISPR too, it was a, uh, maybe a more than 2026 CRISPR, but I think NTLA was 2026, Caribou was like end of 2025 or 2026 too, or maybe it was the reverse between Antilia and Caribou. So Beam has a really good runway into 2027. You gotta remember guys, 2027 is a lot more than three years now. A lot can happen in three years. You know, you talk about, you know, getting more partnerships, you're getting, talking about getting a program FDA approved. You're talking about, you know, diluting your stock um, that literally they could do anytime. Um, although I think companies are holding out on it. You've seen a lot less since 2022, 2023 of those because you know, the stock price decrease of those companies and I think those companies are looking to rebound in the stock price before doing any sort of dilution. But of course, they'll be naive to think that none of these companies would be doing it. Look, as an investor of these companies, including Beam Therapeutics, I don't want them to dilute my stock, right? Um, but ultimately, if, they, if their leadership don't see any partnership viable or any deal that's really viable for them that makes sense, then diluting the stock is a way to, you know, raise cash. I mean, that's the whole point of going, one of the big points of going public, right? Otherwise, just stay private, right? I mean, if you don't, if you're not going to raise cash from the public market, if you can just, you know, turn on a button and get more investments, and if your employees are not complaining at all about making more money from the stocks uh, that they gather as they work there, I mean, just stay private, right? But clearly, uh, that's not the case for about the majority of companies, right? If not all, to be honest, uh, over time given it enough time. So yeah, so this is interesting, guys. Beam 101, that's their first wave. Uh, look, they're describing as wave one, wave two, wave three. I like this. 
I think this is something new. I don't think they've ever described it this way. Um, so wave one is B more than one, right? So uh, they're looking at, let's take a look. First patient that was dosed last year in the last quarter there. Uh, we covered this in this channel. Um, the company is on track to report initial data for beacon trial second half of 2024. So that's really their first wave. I mean, we just went over this in the highlights. So that's pretty big. Uh, anticipate dosing the remaining two patients in the initial cohort and initiating dosing in patients in the expansion cohort of 20. So it looks like, you know, they're going to enroll more patients with another set of dosing, of course. Uh, and the first cohort that they've uh, obviously working on, they've already dosed the first patient last year in the end of 2024. And it looks like they want to dose the remaining two patients. So there's three people in that cohort. Still a small sample, to be honest. Um, so I don't want people to freak out when they see the data, but look, if all three patients get amazing data by end of 2024, then we have to put things in writing at that point, right? I mean, it's pretty clear. Uh, again, small samples, I don't want to lead to conclusions, could go either ways, but um, human data matters, right? We got to look at human data. We have to look at human data. Um, that has always been my speech about being base editors. I buy the promise. I understand the promise. I understand all of the, all of that, but to get to the promised land, we have to get human data. I don't think I'm surprising anybody in this space, whether you're an expert in this space or not. I think that's pretty common sense at this point, especially in 2024, when you do have an FDA program approved in the US, for example, with CRISPR therapeutics using CRISPR-Cas9, either on sickle cell disease, and now, of course, beta thalassemia that we covered um, earlier this week. That was big news too, guys. Okay, so Beam301 or 302 rather. Um, okay, so we're looking at 100,000 patients in the US and preclinical data showed significant levels corrected. Okay, so this is with in vivo, right? This is with in vivo. Yeah. And Beam expects to report an initial cl clinical data set for Beam 201 which is their whole CAR T cell. So Beam Therapeutics is doing something really, really interesting, guys. I, I wanna put the emphasis on their pipeline here. It's been a while I haven't looked at any of these pipelines of any of these companies. Maybe in the next few videos I'll be doing that just to refresh our new viewers, refresh myself too. Uh, so Beam 101 is the bread and butter right now as we speak. Uh, but they're working on their programs too. You know, you got Beam 201, which is the CAR T program, which, is, you know, I would put this program just on an EB 101, to be honest. This is a big program. CAR T cells are no jokes. I just feel like they're sandbagging this program because, you know, CAR T cells are such a hard, tough space that it's so hard to crack into it. Um, I'm not so sure if they're all in on that program. I think we still have to see data. They just said they're going to report data at some point this year. So I'm really curious to see how that data fares against Caribou, for example. Uh, but again, uh, with CAR T cells, you got to see durability, right? So even the first set of data of Caribou was amazing. It was the very, basically the best set of data you could expect. Um, but then the dur durability after six months, that's when things got a little bit uh, hi iffy. I mean, data was still above average from Caribou with the CAR T cell with CBO10, but uh, Beam 201, we really need to see that data either compete with Caribou or be around that same uh, type of performance after six plus months, which we're probably going to get in 2025, right? So don't hold, don't hold your breath for this program yet, guys. I think this is more for 2025 play, uh, but Beam 101 is obviously a play for this year. We're really focused on that. You got uh, 302, which we just talked about earlier there with the in vivo. Um, so that's the whole, uh, that's the whole thing we were talking about here. Uh, we got Beam 301 as well. Um, so you got these two diseases that they're trying to tackle, handling the, that mutation with base editors. Uh, again, we're, we're going to get some patients enrolled, data, uh, clinical data there at some point. So, um, yeah, yeah, CAR T cells is a big one. I, I, I really think more people should be talking about this, but at the same time, I'm just not convinced that Beam is... Uh, I'm just not so sure if... Uh, if CAR T cells are a big, big play for um, for beam therapeutics at this point, it is a tough space, guys. It is no, I want people to understand that there's a reason why there's a lot of support on companies like Sana Biotechnology that's not using CRISPR with their respective programs right now, the leading program anyways. Uh, 
It's because it's a tough space, right? There's nothing right now in the market. But maybe the toughest things in life are basically, you know, what you want to focus on because those are the things that yield the greatest rewards. I mean, if you can tackle CAR T sales problem, then, you know, as a layman explanation here I'm about to give, basically, you put more healthy cells into a human that has cancerous cells. Therefore, healthy cells combat with cancerous cells. Therefore, you can combat cancers, various levels of cancers. That's the promise. Again, it's a promise land. We still have to see any sort of data from beam therapeutics with regard to that promise. But, you know, Caibu's trying to tackle that and they're getting above average data from everything I've discussed in this channel and I've, what I've seen in, uh, you know, x.com and by experts. Caibu is doing amazing so far, but, you know, I think a lot of people were expecting a little bit more when it comes to CRISPR and CAR T cells. I think they were expecting, you know, not just 50 to 55% of durability, but more like 80, 70 to 80, 90% durability. But like I said in this channel, you can, they're working on dosing levels. They can do the frequency dosing. Because again, the promise is to one-time treatment. But nothing stops Caribou, for example, to do two times treatment. For the first iteration of this program, get that FDA approved, and then maybe work on a first time treatment, one dose. Look, there is no cure for it as we speak. So whether or not you do two times, three times, four times dose in your lifetime, if it cures it, it cures it, right? So uh, again, I understand the whole one dose treatment. Again, it puts the bar high. It makes it a lot harder for other companies to compete, especially when you have a company working on a one dose treatment. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we are running against time, right? You guys, you guys remember, this is this is something I spoke in this channel, uh, sorry, in the interview last uh, weekend with Amit Investing is, you know, you have, the FDA has to look at it, right? Either you're just, you know, waiting for data and, you know, talking about all the bureaucracy behind it, or you got actual patients dying on the other side, right? Who, you, at some point, you have to take a decision, right? And these companies face the same problem, Beam 101, Beam 30. Uh, two or three or one or two on one, all these programs, you know, you you can work on all these, you know, clean, preclinical trials and so on, but we need human data, right? We need to get this program out, these programs out rather. And I think Beam Therapeutics is in a good position. They have good highlights. They have a great cash balance sheet. I mean, we just talked about going until 2027 for that. But ultimately, you know, what can these programs do for this company? You know, there's a lot of billions of dollars for these for these companies. You know, they're partnership with like Pfizer, Apelis, uh, Verve Therapeutics. There's so many partnerships with this company. They can become the platform of base editors. But ultimately, we got to see human data. This year is all about human data for this company. They have to, you know, they have to deliver. Uh, I'll be honest with you, if they don't deliver human data um, at all, I think this is going to be a huge blow for this company. Um, huge, huge blow. Um, so... Let me know, guys, what do you guys think in the comments? What do you guys think about the highlights? Do you guys like what's happening with Beam Therapeutics? I've seen, you know, sort of both sides of the argument about this company. You know, full disclosure, I am an investor, like I said, uh, and I know a lot of you guys are. So let me know in the comments, what do you guys think about the highlights? What do you guys think about the pipeline? Thank you so much for watching. As always, subscribe if you're not like this video. Guys, do like it. Support the channel, brings this video to other YouTube homepages. Thank you.